Um, good afternoon, and this is my first DCDC, so I'm delighted to be here. I moved to Senate House Library two years ago from nine years at the National Archives, and two of the main contrasts that struck me moving from archive to library, um, blindingly obvious really, one was scale, TNA, 500 employees, loads of archivists and miles of records coming in every year. At Senate House we have one archivist in a library context, but the other was of course that as a university at Senate House we're a teaching and learning organisation, we're full of students and we're about training up the next generation of professionals. My remit when I arrived at Senate House was to bring in money to set up licensed partnerships between content and publishers, which I've been doing for decades and I wouldn't say I could do in my sleep, but it was, it was kind of the day job. What I wanted to find was something that would bring the specialness of being a teaching university together with accessioning and getting material out online. Uh, which is why, to answer Nancy's cute baby panda, I can show you pictures of llamas this afternoon, because the project that um, came across our, our radar, which seems to fit that wonderful nexus of a three-way partnership, is the archive of the Kusichaka Trust. Just to, um, the light's a bit bright to see the pictures, isn't it? Hope you can focus on them. Um, to give you a bit of, thank you, <laughs> uh, a bit of context about the, the archive itself. The organization started for, out of UCL in 1977, when archeologist Dr. Anne Kendall set off into the high Andes. And her aim was to rediscover and, if possible, reconstruct the Inca infrastructure up in the very high Andes, uh, which had made some incredibly challenging terrain rich and productive until the Spanish colonists arrived. The Incas, we think, we think of archaeology as the prehistoric, unwritten past. Of course, in their last throw, the Incas were contemporaries of Shakespeare, and their civilization was extremely sophisticated and um, expert at managing a very, very challenging landscape, steep slopes, high altitude, poor, poor soils, and making a very productive landscape. When the Spanish arrived, they saw this landscape through European eyes, mountain slopes are for grazing, and a lot of this infrastructure fell into disrepair, collapsed, silted up, or was otherwise left unused. So when Anne arrived in 1977, supported in the early days by the British Army in pre-Falkland days, her mission was to see how much of that um, infrastructure survived and how much, if any of it, could be reconstructed to bring a bit of life and productivity back into the valley. What started as a purely academic archaeological curiosity grew with each summer's digging season into a project which brought not just archaeologists but soil scientists, ethnographers, anthropologists, engineers out from the UK, many of them from the University of London. And over the years, they succeeded in reconstructing and reinstating a lot of that infrastructure. They redug the dew ponds that collect meltwater at the end of the winter and feeds water down through those terraces all year. They reconstructed traditional dwellings. They re-established native crops for food and medicine. They revived traditional weaving and land management systems and pretty much returned self-sufficient productivity to what was a very empty valley when they arrived. They faced wildfires, altitude sickness, alarming levels of disease. But every year, as the work built up, over our summer, the Andean winter gave them the dry, bright conditions that they needed to dig. And over those 40-year digging seasons, they've succeeded in reviving the valley. It's repopulated, and the trust's work has been handed over to the Peruvian government and now runs as an NGO called the Asociación Andina Cusichaca, which continues their work and protects the legacy on the ground. However, all of that work over 40 years produced a lot of written evidence in archaeology, as I'm sure many of you know. Record keeping of what you do is absolutely vital because the minute you dig a site, you've destroyed it. Layer by layer needs recording. The paper records and photographs built up, um, they're about 120 linear meters when um, the collection came across our, our notice. And it's a substantial, unique archive that has really remained relatively untapped simply because it's inaccessible. For many years, it was in a Peruvian monastery, then a British Airways hold, then to Anne Kendall's house in the Cotswolds. When she retired to Spain, it was put in a shipping container, which you can see here, a very well-appointed one, but it's still a shipping container, in a barn in Warwickshire. 
And the reason I'm talking about it today is because the secretary of that, the trust um, was an ex-student of the SAS Institute of Latin American Studies. He'd studied under Linda Newsom. And he came to her in the summer of last year with a plea. The trust and the trustees are now, as you can imagine, a little bit beyond their digging years, and they wanted to find a permanent home, a legacy for that, that record of all their work, ideally in the institution where it all began, back at the university. Better still, with some digitisation thrown in to ensure that the material is widely, widely used around the world by everyone who works on Inca archaeology. Now, as I'm sure most of us have experienced, if you go to your boss and say, can we bring in a shipping container full of unsorted papers, <laughs> the instinctive response is, um, no. Uh, mainly, in our case, on the grounds we don't collect archaeology. So conversations began initially as there's someone who's doing digitization, isn't there? Can we talk to her about finding a partner who would just do that for us? So initially, I was brought in as a matchmaker to bring companies who might want to publish this material to the trust. Two publishers with strong records in Latin, Latin America and archaeology came and had a look and soon began to salivate. The killer fact, of course, is that 80% of US archaeology courses teach the Incas. There are very few, if any, new digs, and this is real raw material that no one's seen before. The archive was already receiving between eight and nine PhD research requests a year while it's still in a barn. Um, so we really do know that there's, there's raw material there with immense research potential. It also became you know, um, obvious quite quickly, as you've heard already, that it isn't just archaeology. There are all sorts of allied disciplines and after-effect disciplines, if you like. There's um, the engineering, the anthropology, the ethnobotany, the soil science, the social history, the politics, Shining Path interrupted a lot of the digs during the political unrest in Peru. There's post-colonial history. And of course, there's the record of the times itself, the 70s and 80s, when this team were out in Peru. The world that they found, these indigenous lifestyles um, that had remained largely unaffected for many years have now long gone. So the professional photographers and, and documents that are coming out of this archive record the world of Peru in the 70s and 80s, every, much as, every bit as much as it does the Incas. When the uh, trustees got out there, they encountered extended families like this in thatched huts, in tiny fields. They'd walk into these huts and find guinea pigs scuttling around on the floor at dinner, not as pets, unfortunately. <laughs> Babies hanging from hammocks in the rafters. Um, it's a land that has in many ways disappeared, and in many ways for the better, but um, <laughs> the 70s are beginning to look as much like a lost world as the Incas, especially for the archaeologists, <laughs> staggeringly inappropriate workwear. <laughs> I don't think any of us would turn up in somebody else's landscape dressed quite like that these days. The 70s, almost looking as historic as the past <laughs> that the archaeologists were excavating. As I said, we started out with 120 unsorted linear metres, but there was a good file level description in the form of a spreadsheet, which the trustees have, have spent a long time um, taking. They grouped every type of document um, into archaeology, admin, publicity, etc. And a cons conservation survey was undertaken in uh, the spring of 2016, which showed that neither the thin air of the Andes or the cold, wet air of Warwickshire seems to have done that much damage, except to that photograph, obviously. Um, so far, so good. But obviously, the missing ingredient for any putative accession with a well out of box list is a catalogue. And that's where the next piece of the jigsaw comes in. I mentioned I'd been at TNA, and one of my ex-colleagues there, who I'm sure many of you will know, is the wonderful Dr. Jenny Bunn, who is now running next doors the UCL um, Archive and Records Management Master's Programme. I wondered if they used real live unprocessed archives to teach archivists what to do. So we had lunch, and yes, they do. And then we spent one of the coldest days on record standing in the shipping container, getting more and more excited by what we found there. And we hatched the plan to use that material after a good old sort out and deduplication over the summer as the teaching material for their curation and processing course this very term. We spent seven days over 
the summer, deduplicating, getting rid of masses of printed books, soft prints of articles, stacks and stacks of the same publicity leaflet. And we've got it down to about half of what it originally was. And we boxed it, as you can see, this is work in progress. It now fits in 300 archival boxes, apart from those maps and plans which are still standing up in cupboards. And then, in September, out it went, loaded onto two vans, and it is now installed in the Durning Lawrence Library within, Shakespeare, within um, Senate House. This was a Shakespeare Scholar's original library in cupboards. And that's the teaching room that the class are using this term to sort it all out for us and hopefully describe it. We're now well over halfway through the term. From um, a predicted course occupancy of 20, once the teaching material went up on the Moodle and the news that you'd be working on real live Inca archaeology, we had 37 students start. And here they are, all crammed into the room, working away. The bright, sharp-eyed will spot the Vena Library's ex-librarian here at the front, one of the students. We have two archaeology graduates and, even more stunningly, a Kusichaka baby. One of the students' parents met as archaeologists on a dig for the Kusichaka Trust. No one knew that before she arrived. Um, and they are learning their craft from the start with this material that's come down from the mountains. Their first exercise was pick a box, any box. You have one hour, then tweet your box. Everyone rummaged, everyone tweeted. Tweets came up on screen in the room and they began to critique and find the terms that they were sharing, common ground, comparing what they were doing. Then they swapped boxes, swapped for another medium. If you had slides before, go for publicity. If you had publicity, go for admin, etc. Now you've got five minutes, then tweet your box. It will be got, got a little bit like Bake Off. Um, and the result is a very buzzy, hive mind approach to archival description, which I think a lot of Certainly my generation of archivists would find slightly unnerving. The traditional approach is one person, a long time, one brain getting intellectual control over a collection, and then we describe it. This method, very, very different, and it's a fantastic example of the disruption of having that digital as well as a group of people to change not just how we can take material in, but the very act of archiving and describing material at all. There is, of course, a bit of grumbling, a bit of resistance. It's not ideal. Are 300 boxes too much for one term and 30 people? Yes, yes, they are. Next year, we've been told any more than 100 boxes and we get slapped wrists. But you have to start somewhere. And this was the most phenomenal opportunity. We're hiring a project archivist to work on a paid basis for at least six months from January to tidy it all up and pull it together so that I can run a competition to get one of those commercial publishers to scan it, digitize it, make it freely available in Peru, and put it to work for us in the US universities outside that system. No profession changes shape or nature in the space of one term, maybe even the space of a generation. But one thing's clear from that exercise, this exercise, that without the benefits of experimental risk-taking projects like this, we simply would not be able to accession anything like this sort of scale of material, certainly within one year. And I'm not claiming that partnership in this sense is, is unique or original. It's been going on for many, many years, as we know. But I do think it's worth setting this particular approach in the wider context of the future of special collections and archives within universities, as reported on in the RLUK TNA report this year. Special collections and archives are what differentiate us from each other. They do have amazing brand value when you're talking to your vice-chancellor. They reek of heritage and specialness, and they're great for a prospectus. I'm not arguing that we should accession only things that are um, you know, of the moment or fashionable, but we do have to keep pace with what today's researchers in our institutes are looking at, post-colonial, Latin American, are absolutely buzzwords um, for the institute and for the wider university. So we have got under that wire of we don't take archaeology, which is to return to the idea that a partnership approach like this actually fits strategically with how the library sits within the university, as opposed to my role just being purely about bringing in money. When we as curators look at the digital landscape and the financial pressures 
of providing world-class research and reader resources. I believe a strategy that prioritises bridge building and partnerships to, boost, to bolster, enable and sustain our special collections in cyberspace is the most sustainable way ahead. And that's why the title of my paper is Building Happy Bridges, because here she is, and on the Kusichaka Bridge. Kusichaka is a Quechua word, that's the native language of Peru, and it means happy bridge. Thank you for listening.